have your Bibles, would you turn to Deuteronomy 6? Deuteronomy 6. If you don't have a Bible, there is one in the pew, and it's found on 151. Um, as you guys are turning there, I kind of want to honor some groups of people this morning. Um, that's why I want the, the children to stay, because um, I think it's good that we honor, honor each other. Um, this is a special day for me. Uh, one, because uh, I, get to, um, I get to talk about my mom. And if you don't know, my mom went to be with the Lord in 2014. So uh, she, is, she is such a great, was such a great encouragement to me. And so dads, kids, today's the day you step up your game. And so uh, honor those women in your life. Uh, they deserve it. And uh, I know my mom did every single year, every single day. My wife does every single day. Um, she puts up with me every single day, so um, she deserves it. Uh, the other, just a couple other groups of people. Um, if you are a, a teacher uh, in the public school, private school, or you are a homeschooling father or, or mother, um, could you please stand for me um, real quick if you are a teacher? If we have, I know we got them in here. We got a lot of them, yeah. Can you give them a, a, a round of applause? You can go ahead and have a seat. This, is, this was Teacher Appreciation Week, am I right, this past week? And, uh, and I'm telling you, you have a hard job. Uh, wow. Um, I, when I talk to some of you and I hear stories, I'm like, I'm amazed that you get through a day. Um, it's, it's incredible. And so we want to appreciate you. Uh, for what you do. I also want to appreciate um, one other group. If you are a teacher in any aspect here at Grace Bible Church, you, you teach in Awana or the children's ministry in any capacity, or you teach uh, the teens or you teach uh, the adults, could you stand? Look at this. This is so cool. Can you give them an applause? <laughs> Go ahead and sit down. The reason why I want to, to mention them is they volunteer. That's not even their job. They, they volunteer to teach, which is amazing to me. Um, I, on t- some of them are, are full-time teachers on top of that, and then they work all day Wednesday, and then they come Wednesday night and they teach, or they are taking time out of their week to prepare a lesson for the children, for you guys, for um, whatever it looks like. And so thank you for what you do. Um, it, is, it is awesome. And then finally, if you are a child or a young, young adult um, between the ages of like, let's say, let's start it at three because I know, I know like a ba- you can raise a baby if you want, um, if you have them in here. Um, but all the way through, through, college age. Could you stand real quick? We don't have to applaud them yet, okay? They don't just get applauses. Or, um, no. What I, what I want to do is I want you to look around the room. And adults, see how many young people we have in this church. Isn't this awesome? I mean, praise the Lord. I've, I've been at churches where you don't see this. And so it's really cool that we have young people that you, the church, are influencing for the gospel. Amen? That's awesome stuff. You guys can go ahead and be seated. Children, you can be dismissed to Children's Church if you want to go. One of my favorite parts of every single Sunday is seeing this. And if this doesn't encourage you, man, I I don't know what to say. I love standing out in that because normally when the stampede happens, I usually go out there and I'm dodging and and I, I stand out in the foyer and I usually follow them down just to make sure things are going okay down there that they don't need something extra. But 
I don't know if you've noticed, but that number keeps growing. Amen. That, it's so cool to watch um, God building His church. Um, I can say, Grace Bible Church is doing all the right things. God's doing all the right things, and we're being used by God. And so that's what's awesome. I can tell you, um, just to give a small report, we have seen an increase in our children's ministry, even from last year. Um, our, our children's ministry has went from average last year of like, like 12 total. Um, I believe in the past month alone, we've been averaging over 20 kids down there, which is incredible. So um, that's why I want to honor the volunteers that are doing what they're doing. Um, you guys are, are doing well. And so thank you for what you are doing. As I get started this morning, I, I, I want to set a disclaimer. We're going to be in Deuteronomy 6. And one, I want to make sure that this piece of Scripture does not leave you feeling guilty as you walk out of here. Because that, that can happen. When we hear Scripture and we're not doing what the Scripture is saying, we can oftentimes walk away going, beating ourselves up, being like, why can't I be a better Christian? And I don't want that. What I want is for you to be encouraged walking out of here. That if you aren't doing some of these things, that you, you feel that God is capable of changing your life, that you would start doing some of these things. There's a portion in this scripture that specifically talks to parents. I don't want the whole, like, if, if you don't have kids or your kids are grown and they're out of the house, I don't want you to be like, oh, this isn't for me. This is what I, why I started the, the, this whole thing the way I started is because we all have a role in the formation of the next generation. I know I rhymed. I didn't mean to. But we, but we do have a role in this. The whole church. Why? Because the, one of the things that bothers me is when, when, they, when people are like, this generation, this is the next church. No, they are the church. This, that's why we, as a, with a collaborative effort, train our, these children in the way they should go. We, now, this doesn't mean that you're like, you see someone parenting their child and you go, eh, let, let me handle this. You know, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is when you have volunteers, the opportunity to volunteer as a teacher. Talk about Jesus. You're forming these children. And it's an incredible, incredible honor to do so. The next thing. I don't want you to feel like a bad parent. I, if, if you feel like it, you're in good company. I feel like it all the time. I don't know if... I could probably do it. I'm not going to do it, but I could probably do a show of hands and most of you would be like, I had my moments. You know, like, just to give an example, I am, I can be, like, interesting. But I also want to say, I want to tell you a story of what I'm dealing with, okay? So, what, I, I have a picture up here, if you want to go to the, the first picture here. This is Evelyn. Cute, adorable, lovely Evelyn. We recently put her in Hapkido. If you don't know what Hapkido is, it's a style of martial art. And so she's learning. We, want, we wanted her to go to learn coordination. And as she's growing, and, and then they, they teach her yes, sir, no, sir. So we're trying to surround her with that sort of stuff as well. She, um, so she, we take her to her first class. And Evelyn is, she, she doesn't know what to do. She's the tiniest human there. And if you see Evelyn, you will know, like, just know that she's my kid, blonde hair, blue eyes, tiny. And so she, she's in there, and they're learning sidekicks, okay? They're, so what they did is they have these two, like, kind of mannequin, kicking bag-looking things, but they look like a human torso, like, detail, like, Six pack, like, like the angry stereotypical bad guy face, like, and it's there's one here and there's one here and they're facing Evelyn and and they got like two other kids doing it as well, down the line and 
and Evelyn gets up there, and the teacher goes up and says, all right, Evelyn, um, I want you to kick, sidekick this one, and then I want you to step and sidekick this one. Okay, can you do that? And Evelyn's like, I, sure, you know, like, I'm four. Um, so she, she goes over, and he's, he's leaving her. This is what she does. She sees this man. Now, she's tiny, so she's got, it's like this much taller than her, okay? It's not that tall. So she goes over, she stands up on her tippy toes, grabs the head of the thing, and kisses it. <laughs> then step back and kicks it. That's what I'm dealing with. It's awesome, though. I love it so much. She, she, like all three of my kids, I love them so much. But I have my moments. Just recently, Evelyn came upstairs from, uh, they got up from nap, and, and Evelyn is coming up the stairs in our house And she's on a kick right now of brushing her teeth. She loves to brush her teeth. Amen. I'm all good with hygiene. So she she does that. And then she's coming up. She's got another toothbrush in hand, her sister's toothbrush with toothpaste on it, coming up the stairs. And she goes, Naomi, I, I got your toothbrush to brush your teeth. And I look at her and I go, no, 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 no. Take the toothbrush back downstairs. Like, put it back in the bathroom. And it's like I kicked her puppy. She was so sad, so discouraged. And I look over at my wife, and my wife is giving me the look that says, why aren't you letting her do this? This is, she's just trying to help. She's doing something for us. Like, I hear all of this through the look. And (laughs) you guys, some of you know the look. I know you do. And... And the reason why I didn't want her to bring the toothbrush was I would, you guys know 99% of the time if something gets taken out of a room by a child, it is going to never return. You're lucky to even find it ever again. It's going to go in that black hole where all your single socks go. You know where it's at. And, and so that's what's going through my mind. And so she's going down the stairs, and you would think, learning moment, Jason, you... You can tell her, oh, it, it, you know, it's okay. Just come back. I didn't. I don't know why, but I was like, you better turn and put that back. And I look back at that, and I was like, what a teaching moment that I passed on. That is like a drop in the bucket. I, so I want you to know I don't have this thing figured out. And I don't expect any of you to either. That's why God gave us Scripture to help us. Because He knew we needed it. In fact, he, he puts this in here. Let's read this. He says, and starting in verse 4. He says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontless between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates." Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you again for today. God, I ask that you would give me the words to speak. I pray that this would be of you. You know what this congregation needs to hear, God. And I, and I trust you to uh, use your words um, to change them and mold them more into the, uh, into the way Jesus looks. And we thank you so much for everything. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Point number one. Uh, you shall love. You shall love. Verse 4 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. This, was, this is called a Shema. It's kind of like a mantra or a, something they would say multiple times through, through their day. They would say this line. 
but they would say it together with other people in times of prayer. And so, really quick, as we start here, I want to I wanna do this together. Can we say this together? Say, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Say it with me. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. This is what they would do. This was to remind them, one, that the Lord is our God. Our God. We do not have any other gods. At this time, they were surrounded by nations who believed in polytheism. Multiple gods. And he is, at this time, he's going, there is, the nation would go, there is one God and he's our God. They would claim him. Isn't that cool? They would claim all day to remind them that they serve one God. And what's cool is that he chose them. The Lord is one. This idea of one is unity. The Lord is unified in himself. And he, there is only one of them. In verse number 5, it says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. This is the very first part that is talked about concerning the commands. Okay, There's a reason. Love precedes obedience. If you notice in verse 5 where it says, And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. He talks about love first. Because if he talked about obedience first, and then love, wouldn't our faith become man-centric? Yes, it would. Because my obedience doesn't lead to my love for Christ. It doesn't. Because if that were the case, then my faith would be based on works. And that's not true. My faith is based on what Jesus did on the cross for me. I bring nothing to the party. And so he's, he's saying this. Love the Lord your God with everything you got. All day. In fact, you'll see in John, uh, John 14, 15. We, we know this. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. This is reiterated. This, this is said, these are the words of Jesus. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Not, you'll keep my commandments and then you'll love me. Obedience comes after your infatuation with Christ. We have to remember what Christ did for us. See, that's, that's sometimes the hard part. How do I love him? Like, I don't, well, first we, we need to understand that we are sinners and need a savior. And that Savior comes as Jesus. And so Jesus died on the cross for your sins because without Him, you're not getting into heaven. He's it. He's the biggest deal. And therefore, our love should, should alone be placed in Him and say, I love you so much for what you did for me. Just that alone. But then after that, we fall in love with Him daily. This is a daily process. That's why we, we see that Shema, right? This is a daily process. We love Him. We fall in love with Him. We talk to Him. One of the questions I have is, how often do you talk to God? How often? I cannot have a relationship with my wife if I never talk to her. Imagine walking in a house and never talking to the person you're married to. I don't think that they would go, he loves me. I don't. Nor do I think that if, if I avoided her, well, she's in this room, gotta go. Like, she wouldn't feel loved and I wouldn't, I wouldn't blame her. So how do we love God? We love Him by talking to Him, by getting to know Him, by appreciating what He did on the cross for us. And that's just the start. And then we show love. We show our love for Him through obedience. And so... My question for you as we start out in, in, at the beginning of this passage, 
Do you love Jesus? Because if you don't love Jesus, the rest of this will not make sense. See, even in 1 Corinthians 13, it talks about um, love being a clanging, or your works being a clanging symbol without love. Have you guys ever seen those? I, I always picture the monkeys. Like, you know what I'm talking about. Um, and like sitting in the, in the middle of the room, you're trying to watch TV. Like, and it just, for some reason, it's getting louder. I know what I want to do with those things. I remember one time I was, you remember those Tamagotchis? I don't know if some of you guys, they were like those keychains. You took care of them and they're digital pets. Like they were a thing. Um, and, and so I remember my, my brother had one. And, and I might have had one too. I'm not throwing you under the bus, Jay, Jay so chill out. Um, so I, I, we had one at least, I know. And what happened was we're in, we're, me and my brother shared a room, and this thing goes off in the middle of the night. And I was like, come on now. And my brother, like, messed with it and then set it down. And then it went off again. My brother throws it across the room. And I lost it. I'm like, it's middle of the night. And I'm like, this is so good. And he said, in the morning, I'm shooting that thing. <laughs> and he did. <laughs> he did. He, he took that sucker outside, laid it on a stump, and shot it with a shotgun. And I was like, praise the Lord. And, and I was like, but it's... These things with, without love, it's nonsense. It's annoying. It's, it's just, it's not enough. Even in Isaiah, the Bible talks about how our good works are as filthy rags to God. Without love, it means nothing. And so, I have to reiterate, do you love Jesus? Because these next parts come from our love for Jesus. How much do you talk about Jesus? I tell you all the time, I talk about NBA basketball. I even have a tie with NBA basketball logos on it. I love it. You're going to hear it from me. If you, my wife said one time that the second she brought up an NBA team, I talked for hours. And then she was like, and then she like asked a question about something around the house and I didn't say another word. Like, we talk about things we love. So how much do you even do you talk about Jesus? Because that's, that's something to think about. Do you love Jesus? Let's go on to the next point. You shall teach. You shall teach. Now this, even though, again, this is for parents specifically, the church, you have a role. You have a role in this. You shall teach them, or verse 6, I'm sorry. And these words I command you today shall be on your heart. Heart, um, in literal translation, is in the innermost organ. It wasn't all, they didn't always say heart. Back in the day, we, our culture says heart because we love something with all our heart. It's a very Disney saying. But this word could even be bowels, like it should weigh on you. This is something that you should think about constantly, something you live by. This should be on your mind all the time. This is something that, again, weighs on you, these commands. Verse 7, you shall teach them diligently to your children and, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. This word diligently can also be replaced with intensively, with to a point, with purpose. Again, it should be on your mind constantly. Teaching, teaching these things. When we rise, sit, walk, and lay down, it should be constant. With extreme effort. Why? 
why should we do this? Uh, like, sometimes I, like, I'm not perfect at this. Sometimes I, I, like, my children will be the ones that remind me at night, we got to do the Bible story. It happens. But why? So, Judges um, 6, if you have this up here. Or Judges 2. I'm sorry. Is, what does it say? It's okay. I can read it for her. Yeah, do Judges 2, 6 through 12. For me. What this, what this is, is this talks about why it is important why it's important to teach the next generation. It says, When Joshua dismissed the people, the people of Israel went each to his inheritance to take possession of the land. And the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great work that the Lord had done for Israel. So what we see is we see a generation that has seen the great works of God. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord died at the age of 110 years, and they buried him with the boundaries, within the boundaries of his inheritance in Timnath Harris, in the hill country of Ephraim, north of the mountain of Gaash. And all that generation also were gathered to their fathers, and there arose another generation after them who did, who did not know the Lord or the work that he had done for Israel. And the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals. This, this is why. If that doesn't scare you a little, I was actually talking to Dave Olson and he, he brought up to me, he goes, one of, one of the greatest failings of Israel was not passing down the faith to the next generation. This should put an urgency in you to take this seriously. The, the cool thing about this is that the Bible reiterates this in other passages as well. Deuteronomy 4, uh, 9 through 10. Do you have that one? Only take care and keep your soul diligently, lest you forget the things that your eyes have seen, and lest they depart from you, from your heart, all the days of your life. Make them known to your children and your children's children. Grandparents. How on the day that you stood before the Lord your God at Horeb, that the Lord said to me, Gather the people to me, that I may let them hear my words, and that they may learn to fear me all the days that they live on the earth. And that they may teach their children so. Deuteronomy 11. You shall therefore lay up these words of mine in your heart and in your soul. And you shall bind them as a sign on your hand. And they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall teach them to your children. Talking of them when you are sitting in your house. And when you are walking by the way. And when you lie down and when you rise. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Do you, are you getting it? God is going, this is important. When God repeats something, it's a big deal. And so this should be huge in your life. Pointing them towards Christ in everything. Teaching them to love Christ and how to love him and why we love him. Sometimes I, I, I look at, at parents, and, and again, I myself fall under this. Parents, we tend, and I put myself in this, we tend to take them out of godly things as a punishment. And we're fine with watching them in ungodly environments. And I'll, let me clarify. I had certain friends in high school that I hung around. 
And there was one, one time my, I, I was, so I'm, I'm in class. It's my sophomore year of high school, and we have the group of, of people that I was hanging around. And they said, hey, we're getting together tonight at my house, me and a group of people. Jay, you're invited if you want to go. And I was like, sure, I'm being invited. That's sweet. Like, <laughs> I love friends. And so I go home, and I, I sit down, and I talk to my dad. And I say, hey, dad, can I go to this person's house? And my dad looks at me and he goes, absolutely not. And I was like, no, dad, you don't get it. Like, it's my group of friends. We're cool. Like, they're, they're okay. And he goes, no, no, I grew up with these people. They're bad news. And I'm like, now, dad, come on. We teenagers, we've been there. Like, and if. Whenever you were teen, you you went to your parent, you asked them to do something, they said no, you got angry. I was angry. I was like, but I can't do anything. If you've seen my dad, he'd throw me through a wall and I I there was nothing I could do. Like you think you're taking a, a car keys out of those vice grips. You are wrong. So there was no way I could get into town. And I'm pretty sure that's why we grew up in the middle of nowhere. I'm like, I'm just saying, like, I think it's like, I'm going to avoid any human contact out here. And my kids will too. Um, we, so I didn't get to go and I was so disappointed. I was so mad. I was so mad. The next school day we go in and they're, they're talking it up. They're like, it was so great. And then someone goes, yeah, but the cops were called. Come to find out, they were drinking. There were drugs in there. And I never, like, after that, whatever my dad said was gold. I was like, thank you, thank you, dad. There are times when we allow our kids to go to there because we trust them, we love them, and we would say, oh yeah, go ahead. I'm so grateful that they kept me out of that. We have to be careful because there's so many times we tend to watch our kids play. Like we're, we're fine in watching our kids play outside until they get in the street, right? We, and then when they get in the street, we're like, nope. Especially if it's a busy street, right? Physically, we want to protect them. And the question I have is, why do we let them play in a busy street, spiritually speaking? We let them play around, and these, the cars just, they, they represent something different. Something else. And God's like, no. In fact, when you see the busy street, it's not just pulling them out. It's saying, here's why I'm pulling you out. You see that right there that's flying by? I did that. You know where it led? This is where it led. And God, God saved me from that. It's not sheltering your, sheltering your children to where they never want to even touch the street as in like, they're far, far away, and you never explain to them. You need, they need to know why. And that is your opportunity to tell them what God has done in your life. What's so cool to me is my, I, and I'll say it a million times, if I'm half the parent that my mom and dad were, I think I'm doing okay. I, my parents were so transparent with me. Now, it wasn't like I was four years old and my dad's telling me all the terrible things he's ever done and why God did this and this in his life. No, but as I grew up, I had questions and my dad never shied away. Why? Because he looks back and he goes, praise God that he saved me from this. My mom was the same way. Praise God that, she, that, that God saved me from this. I'm not in it anymore. And you know what's cool is now I see that in my own life. And I get to do that with my children. And I know without a doubt that my, that my dad will, if my kids grow up and they're blessed to continue to have my dad in their life, 
that they'll have questions for him and he'll go, yeah. Children's children. So that they, the children, when they grow older, can pass that on to their children. But one of the things that, you know, as I was listening to sermons this week, one of the, John Piper had a great, great thing to say. He wanted this to be applicable, right? Because you, I could say, teach your children, and you'd be like, I don't even know where to start. Well, I want to cover three of the top reasons that was, statistically speaking, why we don't teach. And I want to cover those really quick, because I want, I want you to see, and you may not fit these bills, and if so, I want to talk to you, because I, I love discipleship in the home. Parents, you get them all the time. And you could be like, no, you know, they're really busy. Before they go to sleep, when they wake up in the morning, you got them then. Reasons we don't teach. One, we ourselves aren't doing it and we don't want to be hypocritical. So I'm not in the word as much as I should be. I'm not praying as much as I should be. I don't want to, I don't want to make my kid do it because then my kid will... You're not doing it. Why are you, why are you saying it? You, you're not showing it. Don't let this stop you. The answer to this is start today. Don't wait. In fact, learn with your kids. Grow with them. Do the old college rule. Stay one, one day ahead of your students. One day ahead of your children. Start. Baby steps. What does it look like? Maybe just read, read a Bible story with your, with your kids. Explain the story. What does God do in this story? The second one. Our children are too old. They, they're teenagers. I didn't, get them in, I didn't teach them in the formative years of their life. They're teenagers now. Or they're, even, they're, they're outside the home. They're college kids. Well, now they have, they have their own kids now. They're too old. They are never too old. Tell me when you stop being a parent. The answer is never. You, are, you will... It, I, I'm getting it now. Like, my, my parents have helped me even outside the home... Like after I've gone away from home, my parents still help me. I know without a doubt I'll do it for my kids. If I see them in trouble, I'm going to help them out. We can do this spiritually too. Because God is bigger than obstacles. And so they are never too old. What does it look like then if they're older? Well, tell them about what God did in your day. Well, I, Jason, I don't, I don't really have that story. Pray for one. And then watch out. Talk about God, what He's done in your life with them constantly. They're never too old. Pray for them. Love them. Show God to them every day. Number three, we are afraid our children will ask a question we don't know the answer to. I love what Piper says. Count on it. Count on it. I don't know the answer to everything. And I'm a pastor. You're going to ask me questions, and there may, I may look at you quizzical and be like, Ugh. but I pray that I would help you find the answer. I can tell you this is an opportunity for you to learn, but also to teach your kid humility that you don't need to have it all together. You don't. Because there's there's someone who does have it all together and we're relying on Him. Don't worry. Don't worry about being a hypocrite. When you love Jesus and you are leaning on Him, guess what? You're going to fail. Count on it. This is normal, normal life. But Jesus. And so if they're asking questions, 
Thank God that they're asking questions. Don't go, I don't know the answer. And then just walk away. That's a great question. Let's look into that. Let's look into it tonight before you go to bed and do it. One of my biggest fears is that when, when students start asking questions and they get a little spicy, like they get a little bit, they, they hit a, a soft spot in a, or a, it triggers you a little bit. My fear is that when we run away from them, they will no longer feel comfortable in the church to ask questions. So guess where they're going to go? Somewhere else and ask questions. And I can... Almost guarantee you, it's not going to be from another church. I've met too many people that, that are sour towards the church because they, they avoided them because they asked questions. It's okay to ask. But it's, it's even more important that Christians, from a biblical perspective, from a godly wisdom perspective, answer the question. So parents, that is what you are called to do. Last point. Point number three. You shall reinforce. You shall reinforce. Verse number eight. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. This was at first, when they first did this, this was metaphorical. But this became literal. The Jewish people, when they started failing, started doing this. They would write these verses and other verses like it, and they would put them in these boxes, and they would bind them on their arms. They would walk around, and they would be like, I need a reminder. (laughs) Like, and they would have them there. They would write them on their arms. They would have it on, um, on scrolls that they carried around with them. They did this all the time because they knew they would fail, and they wanted to make sure that, one, they remembered The Lord our God, the Lord is one. I need to love the Lord my God with everything I got. And I need to teach them, I need to teach these commands to my children and my children's children. And they would do, and they repeat it over and over and over again. This was a reminder. And then the last part, you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. This was to reinforce your faith and to let anyone outside know that your house was a house of the Lord. The nation would do this literally so that when people from the outside looked in, they would see that they were a nation that served one God, the God, and that's it. It was to remind them that when they returned back from their day, that they would see these doorposts and the gates and they would go, oh yeah, I need to do this. Something that um, I took from my wife and, and actually her mom, Kim, is they, they, write, they would write verses everywhere. And so I started doing a dry erase marker on my bathroom mirror. And I would write a verse that, or a passage that I want to memorize because I want to remember. There's uh, the, the verse that Pastor Mark quoted last week. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 16, be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong. Let all that you do be done in love. And that reminds me daily to be watchful, to stand firm in my faith, to act like a man, and to be strong in the Lord, and that everything I do be done in love. You can do this too. Baby steps. Don't expect to be like this expert baby steps. You can start somewhere. To close, I, um, in honor of Mother's Day, I did want to tell a story about my mom. This is going to kill me. That was, this picture is the year that she found out that she had small intestine cancer. This was before it. We had a, um, a baby shower at our church for Evelyn, my firstborn. And she came up with uh, Kim, my mother-in-law, and she, 
She was so great. They both were so great. I can tell you this. We left our house and we came back and it was spotless. They, they, they took control. Um, they did it. She got diagnosed in March of 2014. She passed away in December. And she fought it the entire way. She was very inspiring. Um, but one of the things that, that sticks with me in her battle is it was in August, we had, uh, I had a mission trip. We did one in Detroit, Michigan with the Detroit Rescue Mission with our teens there. And um, I get a phone call on the very last day that we're doing the mission trip. Hey, Jay, your mom's in ICU. Um, I don't know what you want to do, but you probably should come down. And the pastor up there was really gracious in all this. And he, he was like, go, get your plane ticket and get down there. So uh, me and my wife and uh, we, we went, we drove down or we flew down, whatever. We got down here. As fast as we could. And we, we get to the ICU. And I see my family. And, and we're hanging out. And I had gotten to see my mom a couple of times. And she, she was laying in the bed. And um, just her, her white blood cell count had just went up. And blood pressure problems and everything else. And so I, you know, I'm sitting in the waiting room. And I was like, you know, I'm going to go hang out with my mom. So I went in and I sat down with my mom. And she could tell that I was... I was shaken. I was, I was visibly scared. Like, I didn't enjoy seeing my mom like that. So, but she said a line that's so good. She said, Jason, don't worry. I'm at peace knowing that all four of my kids are saved and love the Lord. I did my job. I want that. And my prayer is that you do too. This next generation is too important to forget. I praise God that I had the mom I had. And some of you may not have that. But don't let that affect the outcome that you can have on your children. God is bigger than obstacles. And he loves you and he loves your kids and he wants to see them come to know him as well. Amen. Are you with me on that? It's so good and it's too important to miss. Let's pray.